Our first presenter today is Michelle G. Michelle G is a master's student in mechanical engineering. Her presentation is how plant chemistry plays a role in wildfire. Let's have a big round of applause for Michelle. Woo! Thanks everybody for being here. Um, as Karina said, my name is Michelle. And today I'm gonna to be talking about my research, which is how plant chemistry plays a role in wildfires. So when you think about wildfires, you probably think about something like this. Trees burning, smoke, a lot of heat, but you're probably not thinking about chemistry. But chemistry is fundamental in these processes. Chemical reactions drive combustion, and they are the reason that fuels burn. In order to understand and fight fires, we need models that incorporate chemistry. Let me take you back, August of 1949, when a wildland fire broke out in Mangulch in Montana. It was 100 degrees on a south-facing steep hill covered in dry grass, perfect conditions for a bad fire. And a team of smoke jumpers were sent in to fight it. Suddenly, the wind picked up and the fire exploded. Estimates are that the fire covered 3,000 acres during 10 minutes during this blow-up stage. The foreman did something counterintuitive. <laughs> he lit a spot fire in front of him and his men to try to burn the fuels before the fire could reach them. I don't know about you, but if I was in the situation with a fire surging toward me and my boss was in front of me, and he decided to light another fire, I probably wouldn't stop to ask him what he was doing. I would run. And 12 of the men did. But the foreman's strategy worked. The fire missed him and one other man who stayed with him because it had no fuels. The men who ran away did not survive. The Man Gulch fire demonstrated that we need research into fire mechanisms things like combustion and fuel. These boil down to chemistry and energy. And that is the focus of my research. I do computational modeling of chemistry and energy during ignition of living fuels. Now, why living fuels? Because they behave differently in a wildfire. They're chemically different. Living fuels are made of three main constituents, um, cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, but they also have oils that can erupt from them during a fire like this. This video was taken by my coworker, Nate Gardner, in the Sire Lab, and this is a phenomenon called droplet ejection. It's when the oils eject from the foliage during a fire and they ignite in the air or they spread fuel to neighbors. Foliage, the green part of living plants, also is very high in simple sugars. In a fire, these provide quick and intense energy. Now, when I model for wildfires, I'm modeling for something that changes over space and time. Specifically, what I look at are chemical composition or different plant species, fuel classes, difference between foliage and thin or thick branches, and the heat flux, or the amount of heat that's applied to a sample, and how varying these factors affect predictions for temperature, released gases, time to ignition, and how much of the fuels are going to burn. This results in a large system of matrices of differential equations, with hundreds of variables and equations at each time step. In order to get accurate predictions, I need good data to estimate the variables at the first time step. So to do this, I collaborate with experimentalists in my lab and at the Missoula Fire Sciences Lab in Montana. Experiments help validate my modeling approach and help me make better predictions and improvements to the model. So these are some results from an initial, initial study that I did. On the bottom are the experimental results I was trying to simulate and on the top are the results from the model. I matched the heat flux and the initial conditions of the experiment in the model and ran the model for the same duration of time as the experiment. And as you can see, it agreed pretty well. 
2% uh, agreement between the experiment and the model is uh, much better than I could have hoped for and something I've been working toward for a long time. Now, many other physics-based models with similar approaches represent forest fuels as only their three main constituents, which again are cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. But for living fuels, this often isn't enough. So I'm going to show that on the next slide, what happens when you change the chemical composition and its effect on predictions. So these bottom two results are the same as the previous slide, and then the top three are runs where I artificially changed the chemistry in the model. So as you can see, not accounting for cellulose changes predictions by 16%. And if I use the approach that many other people use, um, accounting for the fuel as only cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, it changes the predictions by 36%, 35%. So the key takeaway here is that having detailed chemistry for living fuels is very important for this type of modeling. So this is an iterative process, it's a, it's a work in progress. Um, and while I, of course, am very excited about this approach, the truth is that large scale wildfire models cannot handle chemistry of this detail. So my goal is to communicate and incorporate key findings from my research to add fidelity to large scale wildfire models. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle.